just to say that this is a this is an honour. It's a privilege to be asked to speak at the commemoration of uh, David and Joe. Um, I was I was on a picket line the morning after we heard about David's death, and I can remember the sadness that went throughout the movement. And it was exactly as well, as the old Joe Hill thing, isn't it? Really. Because within days, the movement message was don't mourn, organise. And that's exactly what we did. And can I just pay tribute? With regard to the lesbians and gays who came out and supported us in, in that campaign, that was heroic, to be honest. Absolutely heroic. Because if there's two groups... two groups, exactly has been said, that the establishment were targeting at that time was anyone who'd come out as lesbian and gay and anyone was a trade unionist. Combine that together and it sent the sun into an absolute frenzy. And you know my line on the sun. I had a, had a bloke phone me who said, I'm a journalist from the sun. He wanted a comment. I said, you can be one or the other, but you can't be both. <laughs> and as a Liverpool supporter, I went alongside those who were campaigning for Hillsborough as well, and I remember how much they traduced those individuals and their families as a result of their smear campaigns in the sun. And they're doing it now, aren't they? Have you ever known a Labour leader like Jeremy Corbyn come under this sort of prolonged assault by every aspect of the media, broadcast, written, all the Murdoch press, and goes beyond? And I have to say as well, the BBC as a public service at times should be ashamed of itself <laughs> in the way it should be. I also want to say this as well, and I'll embarrass him. I'm proud to be on any platform with Ian Lavery for the role that he played in that dispute. I wish he'd stop shouting at me because he's all his speeches are like pit head speeches, whether in cabinet or in the on the floor of the House of Commons. But I tell you, the Tories are terrified of him. And when we go into government, he'll be one of the people who will drive through our programme with a determination based upon class <coughs> solidarity that he's shown throughout his life. <laughs> As I said, I, when I was a kid, when I left the university, I was on the shop floor and did night school and then went off to do a sandwich course and then went off. And I, I, to be honest, I, I, everyone in my year wanted to be a politician or a trade union leader. I, I wanted to be a manager of the co-op. I was going to transform the co-op and demonstrate what cooperation could do. They bloody well just wouldn't give me a job. <laughs> Every time I went for an interview, I think I swamped them. So anyway, a job came up with the NUM and I applied for it. And I was interviewed by, well, some of you remember these names, Lawrence Daly, Mick McGuire, Joe Gormley. I almost fainted when I went into the room because these were working class heroes of mine. All of them self-educated man. Mick McGuire was one of the most best read people I've ever met. Lawrence Daly, who could quote Burns and Shakespeare at will, extraordinary individuals. And I was appointed as the assistant head, the deputy head of the social insurance department. Fantastic title. In the insurance department, there was the head, the deputy head, and the secretary. That was it. <laughs> and I was responsible partly for industrial interest, but mainly for mine workers' pension scheme. So let me tell you this. My friend Bryn Davis, who I worked with the TUC, did a review of the MPS for this union. When we go into government, we're going to review the MPS and the way my work is going to be Because we believe over the years, successive governments have used the agreement that was reached, and remember the NUM was not part of that agreement, that agreement was foisted upon them, have used it, I think, to milk funds from the the union pension fund rather than being distributed to the people who desperately need it. I also want to repeat what was said. It was a huge commitment that was given in our manifesto this time to secure basic trade union justice in this country. But you can't have justice until you've looked at the injustices. So when we go into government, Exactly has been said. We promise there will be an inquiry into all grief. We will get the truth and we'll bring to book those people 
because we want to right the wrongs of the suffering that occurred on the day itself. We will bring to book, just as happening in Hillsborough now, those, per those people who perpetrated the violence, the unjustifiable violence against our members on that day. And that's a solid commitment when we go to the <laughs> It's important when we talk about the strike, when it's important when we talk about the, the loss of David and Joe's lives, it's important that we situate it in the history of our movement, of course, but also in the economic history of what's happened over the last 40 years. Because this was one of the first major battles against what we now call neoliberalism. Then, if you remember, they called it monetarism. It was, it was one of those ideas perpetrated by Thatcher's main advisor. Can you remember him? Sir Keith Joseph. We were never completely sure about what level of well, let's not go there, I suppose, but you know as well as I do, he was a bizarre character. We were never completely sure whether he's actually on this planet or not. But he, he was the advocate, he convinced Margaret Thatcher about the concept of monetarism that we now call neoliberalism. Well, what did that mean? Because it's dominated economic and political thinking for a long period of time, for nearly four decades. First of all, it means that you cut taxes, you cut taxes, it's called trickle down economics. You cut taxes for the rich and the corporations, and somehow this is meant to trickle down through the rest of society, and all of a sudden we all become wealthy. Secondly, you introduce austerity measures, you cut back on the role of the state, and that means cutting back on public service provision. And then also, you give the opportunities to profiteer from the public sector, from public service. So you privatise. But then also, what you do is you deregulate. But you deregulate in the city in particular. And I can remember during the, the period of the miners' strike, Dennis Skinner and Brian Sedgwell produced a pamphlet. I produced it with them and circulated it round. It was called The Casino Economy. And it was about the big bang of the city when deregulation took place. And it turned the city into a casino on a scale we've never seen before. But then also, there's the other concept in neoliberalism, which is about sweating the assets, making sure that those you employ, you exploit to the maximum. And to do that, you have to eradicate trade union rights. So the miners' strike was key in the struggle that the establishment were waging to impose neoliberalism on us for the next 40 years. And the way they wanted to undermine trade union rights was not just through legislation, they wanted to smash a union. And because, exactly as been said, the NUM, we'd defeated them before, they targeted the NUM to make an example to every other trade union. That's what the miners' strike was all about. It was about imposition of neoliberalism, and part of that was smashing the trade union movement. And they didn't care when they smashed the whole industry. They wanted to make the point to every living trade unionist that they could break us. They never did, and they never will. What we've said... <laughs> what we said on those picket lines, if you remember, is that even if we have to go back to work, we will go back with our heads held high and we will ensure this struggle goes on at every level, whether it's industrial, political or in solidarity with every other movement that's fighting back as well. And that's what the NUM has done ever since that strike. And that's what the lesson you taught the <coughs> trade union movement, and yes, the trade union movement, in its revived form now, is implementing that lesson. Because I'm so proud, you know, I've been on picket lines now with the kids who came out from McDonald's to strike and TGI Friday. Youngsters who've had enough of zero-hour contracts, have had enough of bullying management and have had enough of peanuts for pay. And this is the new generation that's come forward in the most vulnerable working conditions. And yet they've stood up and they've said, we're not taking it anymore. 
And the best way of fighting back is to join a trade union. Do you know what I'm proud about, especially, is we now have Labour MPs, and they're on this platform, who join those picket lines, who support those workers in struggle. That's what Dan But part of that struggle is political, and that's what we're about. What we're about now is making sure that we expose what neoliberalism is all about. This experiment for the last 40 years that's failed, failed so dramatically. And it's failed with such human consequences. Tonight, it'll be a cold, wet night, right the way across the country. Yet there'll be 5,000 of our fellow citizens, because that's what they are, because it could happen to any of us, they'll be sleeping on the streets. And in my constituency in West London, I've lived there 40 years and represented it for the last 20 odd, there'll be families living in sheds and garages rented out to them. And before Christmas, we were dealing with families living in vans. I got Ken Loach down and we showed last year the film Kathy Come Home. We had 250 people there. And people said, this isn't then, this is now. This is now. Homelessness on a scale we've not seen since the Second World War. Why is that? Why is that? Because Thatcher introduced it. Not just stopping building council houses, but selling them off as well. Well, I tell you, the lesson for us... The lesson for us is that when we go back into government, we're going to build a million new homes, and I'm going to be proud. Half of them are going to be council homes, and we're going to be proud to call them council homes once again. And we, will, and we will not tolerate a society, the fifth richest country in the world, where our fellow citizens have to sleep out on the streets. And you know, the lesson around the privatisation has come remarkably clear, hasn't it, in recent years under this government as a result of their neoliberal policies. Privatisation of our NHS, academisation of our schools, the undermining of some basic services that we thought the state would always provide. So the privatisation of justice, our prisons, our probation service, most of them now as a result of that in a state of collapse. So we're going to end the neoliberal agenda when it comes to public services. We're going to make sure they're properly funded, our schools. We're going to make sure our NHS is properly funded. But you know what? When I meet health workers, they say, yes, we want the money put in, but there's no use putting it in the front door if it gets launched out the back door to Virgin and other privateers. So when we go back into government, we'll end privatisation. And we need to learn some lessons as well of some of the mistakes that were made even when we were in power. And that is about PFI. Yeah. And we've said now, we will end PFI and we'll bring the PFI back into democratic ownership and control. Why? Because we're fed up with being ripped off. And we're fed up with workers being exploited when they are transferred under PFI schemes. And do you know we want to go further? We want to go further because we want to learn the lessons of the Apley government in particular. If you want to develop an economy in which prosperity is shared, well, there's some basics in our economy that actually have to be under public ownership and control if we want a fair society. So that's why I say we're bringing rail back into public ownership. We're bringing water back into public ownership. We're bringing royal mail back in and we're bringing energy back in. All of this is to ensure that we learn the lessons from the miners' strike and that period in the 80s when neoliberalism found foundations were established. So that does mean, yes, it means that we'll end the privatisation, it means, yes, we'll ensure services are invested upon, and it does mean as well that we'll grow the economy and make sure that prosperity is shared by everybody. But you know, there's two things that are needed to lay those foundations. One is a fair taxation system. Because if we want to fund those public services, we need the resources to do that. 
So what we've said in the last general election, and we published a, an alternative budget to demonstrate, we'll have a fair taxation system. So yes, it does mean that the richest, the top 5% <coughs> of earners will pay a bit more. It does mean we'll pull back some of the corporation tax cuts, because the argument was you've cut the taxes to the corporations and suddenly they'll start investing. Well, they're sitting on £700 billion pounds worth of earned income, not invested. Business investment is stagnating. So what we've said is we'll ensure in reversing those corporation tax cuts, we use that money to invest. But also, we've said, and some of you have campaigned for this, we want to introduce what we've campaigned for for years. We used to call it a Tobin tax. It's a transaction tax on the City of London. So when the share speculation goes on, we simply take a limited amount to enable us to fund the services that we need. But also, you know, we've said very, very clearly, the rich and the corporations, they're going to pay their taxes. And you know, during the general election, I was accused of having this magic money trick. Well, we've found it. It's in the Cayman Islands. We're going to dig it up and we're going to bring it over here. So we can, we can end the cuts, we can end the privatisation, we can have a fair taxation system, we can invest in our economy and grow the prosperity. But you know as well as I do that the way in which we have endured this last eight years in particular <coughs> has seen some startling incidences of poverty within our society. Four and a half million of our children are living in poverty. Only months ago, and this has never happened before, the UN sent a rapporteur to inquire into our social security system, how we support system, how we support people, and what the levels of poverty there were in our society. And I tell you, any other government in our history would have been shamed at that report. Because a UN rapporteur, the UN, describes not just levels of poverty, but uses the word destitution. And then in particular for disabled people. Another report, another UN rapporteur, only 18 months ago, described systematic abuse of human rights of disabled people. This is meant to be a civilised society. As I say, it's the fifth richest country in the world. And yet we have a million and a quarter food parcels handed out to people because they can't put food on the plates to feed their children. Ian and I were at Shadow Cabinet a week ago, and it's not disclosing any secrets, we had Mark Drayford there, who's the Welsh leader, Welsh Labour leader. He described how one of his ministers had been in a primary school. And they were doing that usual discussion on primary school, where does food come from, you know, about the animals and all that sort of thing. What crumpled him was one of the children sitting around the table said it comes from a food bank. So we're normalising food banks within our society as a result of the neoliberal policies that are being introduced by this government. So I say this, we're going to make sure, first of all, when people go to work, they earn a real living wage and we'll start it at £10 an hour straight away when we go in. Also, you, know the, you know the best way of securing and protecting your wages, don't you? It's join a trade union. So when people join a trade union, when people join a trade union under a Labour government, from day one, they will have trade union rights, just as John Smith, our leader, promised. But in addition to that, they will have trade union rights abiding by international labour organisation conventions that apply across the world. We're not asking for the moon, the earth. We're asking for a government that simply abides by international law. So what does that mean? It means the restoration of sectoral collective bargaining. Only 20 years ago, 80% of us had our wages determined by collective bargaining on a sectoral basis. Now it's down to 20%. We're going to reverse this. We're going to establish a Department of Employment 
in which we'll be able to enforce the minimum wage, make sure people have a real living wage, make sure trade union rights are restored again in this country. And Ian and I have promised, within the first 100 days of a Labour government, we will scrap the anti-trade union legislation that was introduced by this last time. That's the sort of society we're going to create. We prepared our last manifesto and you saw what happened. We were, when Theresa May went for that walk in the Welsh hills, I wish she'd go again. <laughs> when she went for that walk in the Welsh hills, she came back and called a snap election. She'd promised us on nine separate occasions not to, but she did. Why was I not surprised at a Tory line? We were 24 points behind in the polls at that point in time. And I was doing interview after interview and people were predicting that we would be wiped out. It would be like the 1930s, there'd be a rump of us left. And I said then, no we won't. I think we'll win, but I will improve in the polls. And people thought, what is he on? When we got to the general election and we had a semblance, legally obliged semblance of balance in the broadcast media, you saw what happened. People discovered what Jeremy Corbyn was really about. A principled, honest, and yes, a strong leader. But they also saw our manifesto, a manifesto drawn up on the ideas that you yourselves have been campaigning for for years. And you know, Ian and I were in that meeting when we were we were going to launch the manifesto on the, on the Monday and it was the Thursday night and Seamus Milne took a phone call and he came back in ashen face and said the, the manifesto has been leaked and I put my head in my hands and uttered a, a number of unfamiliar middle age, middle, uh, <laughs> expressions from the Middle Ages, let's put it that way. <laughs> that manifesto was then leaked. For the next four days, we had wall-to-wall -wall coverage of that manifesto, and we shot up in the polls by 12 points. Now, I got the blame for leaking, it wasn't me, but I'll tell you next time. <laughs> <laughs> but it showed you, it showed you what people had argued against for years. That if you put radical policies forward, if you give people a vision of a transformative vision of a socialist society, they argued for years that people wouldn't vote for it. Well, they did, and they voted for it in large numbers. And what was thrilling about it, the new generation coming forward voted for it en masse. Now, what we're doing now is taking that manifesto of every policy, preparing implementation manuals, drafting legislation so it's on the shelf, so we hit the deck running whenever the next election comes. But also we're developing the new manifesto looking for ideas, touring around the country, meeting after meeting, talking to people about the ideas that they want to see us go into government with to transform their lives and our society. So I believe whenever that general election comes, we'll be ready. We'll be ready with the policies, with the ideas, but above all else, we've got to be ready, not just with our half a million members now, We've got to be ready with the biggest political and social movement that this country has ever seen. To take us into government with a majority to implement those policies, of course, but also to sustain us in government. Because just as the establishment have come at anybody, any group that has stood up to them, of course, they'll come at us. But we'll be buoyed up. We'll have the foundations of a working class movement reconstructed, rebuilt, developed and enhanced and built upon not just all of us who have been through the struggle over the last 30 or 40 years, but this new generation that's come forward. And the type of society we're going to create, I repeat, time and time again, it will be radically fairer. It will be radically more equal. It will be radically more democratic. But it will be based upon, yes, an economy which is environmentally and economically sustainable but it'll be a, a prosperous economy where that prosperity is shared by everybody. What do you call it? You call it socialism, solidarity.
we've now got the policies, we've got the people in place, we just need the election so that we can get in there and get cracking on. As a, as a thank you, John, for addressing this year's David Jones Jobby Memorial, I'd like to present you with a little token of our appreciation. Um, the chapter is actually entitled... The chapter is actually entitled Everyone Era, but as we all know, as one era ends, another one begins, so we look forward to the future. And there's a copy of the Oaks Disaster Memorial Book. Thank you, John.